I'm Jeffrey, and this is Plain Spoken. If you're a new viewer, welcome. I talk about conservative perspective stuff on the United Methodist Church, Global Methodist Church, WCA type stuff. If you're a Methodist and you want to know what's going on, uh, if you want to understand how some conservatives think through things or see things, uh, then welcome. I'm glad to uh, put out content. I've been doing this in earnest for a little bit, and I'm really happy with the amount of engagement we've gotten on YouTube and Facebook and on our podcast. Uh, just want to thank all of you who are liking and subscribing and promoting uh, the stuff. I obviously enjoy it. Um, I, I, it's not the highest quality stuff because I have a whole other full-time job that I'm doing, uh, but I'm, I'm really happy to, to do my best to stay abreast of this stuff, and um, I sure hope I'm never saying anything wrong. I'm trying to be accurate about everything. We know misinformation is a problem. So uh, anyway, I, uh, just as a brief follow-up, I put out a, a good deal of content recently, um, and I'd encourage you to go see it if you haven't. I did an interview with Bishop John Wesley Johanna of Nigeria, Episcopal area. Very interesting. Uh, he's, he's our most vocal conservative bishop still in the UMC, so check that out. I also did a follow-up on uh, a report I did on the three bishops that signaled that they were leaving the UMC for the GMC and what's happened there. And then I just did a, a brief thing on this recent announcement uh, from the Council of Bishops saying that central conferences cannot disaffiliate under paragraph 2553, and uh, that's had a lot of fallout. Um, one, one commenter in particular from the Philippines, uh, that they seem to be very distressed about what's going on over there, so um, I've been doing some additional reading on that. I may post something for my brothers and sisters in the Philippines, so we'll see. Um, the, the, the thing that I've done that's gotten the most traction has been that I've reported on a couple specific annual conferences and the things that are going on there. Um, and of course, I, I missed a ton of details, and I appreciate those of you who uh, emailed me and gave me additional resources, additional texture. Um, I'm hoping to continue doing this. In fact, this episode right now is on the West Virginia Annual Conference. And before I get into that, I just want to encourage you, if you are from an additional annual conference that you think uh, everybody would benefit from understanding, then you're very welcome to email me at plainspokenpod at gmail.com, pod like short for podcast. Um, and if you want to send me any articles or any personal reports, I don't do stuff, I don't like just pass on rumors or unsubstantiated stuff. Um, but if you if you know that your annual conference is a, a good uh, example of a phenomenon that I've talked about or should talk about, you're very welcome to to email me and reach out, and I'll try and get back to you. Um, West Virginia, I uh, there's no reason why I decided to go on to this one. I just thought it's good to look at different places and see how things are the same, how things are different. Um, the, the, the way I thought we would kind of dive into this is Chris Ritter wrote an article called Disaffiliation and the Coming Drop Deadline, uh, published in September of last year where he, he presented this theory about the strategy of institutionalists at, at trapping um, conservatives in the denomination, but only the ones that don't have a lot of fight in them so that they can just be rolled over. So the way that he summarizes that at the end of this article is uh, this last paragraph here. If I'm right on this, the losers are traditionalists who are lulled into complacency. There's a lingering narrative among some Methodists that the UMC's teachings, at least on paper, are still orthodox, and there is no reason to exit until General Conference acts. But the illusion that General Conference runs the UMC has been dispelled. In the face of certain division, institutional-minded bishops are getting what they always wanted, an exit just wide enough to bleed off the most motivated traditionalists and their leaders. The door will once again then be locked. So that's a, that is what is called conjecture. And this is something that uh, a lot of institutionalists and liberals find very um, inappropriate. The, the term misinformation has been used, but I think conjecture is something that we can't help but uh, do. You know, uh, we, we can't help but imagine the future and try and uh, prepare for it. So there's actually a guy from West Virginia named Scott Knowlton. He's got a blog. Um, I, I found this one article that he did that kind of explains where he is and where perhaps some other conservatives in West Virginia are. Uh, he's from West Virginia, if I didn't say that. Um, I highlighted, um, you know, a lot of people think and caricature conservatives as people who just want to have conflict. They just like conflict. 
but he, in, he anticipates this. He says, nobody prefers controversy. I do not prefer controversy, but I will also not avoid it to achieve a false peace. I've never avoided it. And that's the thing that conservatives have been up against for some time. If you've been reading Matthew Sickle or some of more recent stuff from uh, uh, Good News Magazine, there's a lot of history leading up to right now where there's been a lot of dysfunction for a long time. And uh, the reason we find ourselves here now is because we weren't up to the task of um, reacting soberly, maturely to what was going on in the moment. We have been avoiding and denying things for a long time. Not all of us. Some people have been uh, hollering about it. A lot of people have just voted with their feet and left. But what's to be done right now with those who are still in the United Methodist Church? A couple other phrases I highlighted from him I find useful. When conference leadership is telling churches that they do not need to worry about what's happening in other churches or other conferences or other jurisdictions, quote, because they're not happening in our church or conference, quote, that is not true. It's coming. Now, I'm not going to say that he's right in saying it's not true. Hypothetically, it's possible that those things are not happening yet in some annual conferences. Maybe West Virginia has been upholding the entire Book of Discipline and doing a good job at that. I, I did ask a couple people in their conference, are you aware of anyone being brought up on charges for anything in the last 10 years? And they said no. So my understanding is that bishops don't exercise discipline unless a charge is brought. But even so, it's possible that no one's been uh, breaking the book of discipline. Uh, but even so, he's saying it's coming if it's not already here. And that is conjecture, but it's conjecture worthy of entertainment. Uh, the second phrase, what happens in the Western jurisdiction matters to United Methodists. In the short gap in West Virginia, whether anyone wants to admit it or not, do not let them tell you it does not. So he's addressing this notion that what happens in uh, the loony liberal parts of the denomination are not going to impact the more conservative areas. They will leave us alone. And he's making the argument, no, we're connectional. They are not going to leave you alone. Um, and, and you need to anticipate this. So I introduced that stuff because in West Virginia, the dynamics are uh, they're interesting. There are roughly 1,000 churches. They're about 80 percent conservative, um, according to the people that I talked to. They could be wrong. How It's, it's conservative-dominated. Uh, there, there's their bishop. Uh, I'm not aware if she's liberal or conservative. They aren't either. They just know she's been real easy to work with, um, and so it's not a hostile area. There is not heavy-handed institutionalist behavior. Um, it's, it's been an easy place to be a conservative for a long time. But even so, um, a very similar conference. I, I, I thought this was worthy of looking at. Very similar conference to them was Northwest Texas Annual Conference. Now, they were much smaller. They uh, had 196 churches before all these disaffiliations. But um, when they had their special called Annual Conference last year for disaffiliation, 74% of them, 145 out of 196 churches disaffiliated. That's according to a UM News article put out at the end of last year. So very similar percentage, conservative dominated. West Texas, Northwest Texas Methodists ran for the door as soon as they got out. What's happening in West Virginia? West Virginia, I, I, I'm not going to say anything bad here. If you're, if you're looking for someone to just impugn character and motives, I'm, I'm not going to do that. From what I can tell, they have a very capable and fair leadership structure in West Virginia Annual Conference. Um, I got on their YouTube. I'm, I'm highlighting their Facebook page right now. I'm, I'm envious of them, honestly. We don't have a Facebook page in Oklahoma. Um, our communications team does, but they, they are regularly doing a good job equipping the saints for ministry. They have a lot of people following them, and then their bishop is regularly, if you just scroll down their, their timeline, she's regularly putting out videos to equip and encourage her people. Um, as I've talked to conservatives there, it's clear with them that their bishop has taken the time and put in the energy to earn their trust and have uh, a good relationship with them. I've only listened to a little bit of what she said. She doesn't do any of the signaling, uh, political or theological, to to, to hint where she's at. She really does seem to be trying to be a bishop for the people that she serves. Um, so it's it's uh, that's part of what makes sense to me out of why it is that people aren't running for the door. Um, they've had personal conversations with her about 
disaffiliation and their concerns, and she seems to hear them and care about them. Um, the, the thing about uh, West Virginia, though, is, uh, well, it's not West Virginia, it's this whole denominational situation, is there is a time limit on disaffiliations. Paragraph 2553, of course, eclipses at the end of, or expires at the end of this year, and after that, there is no way out, supposedly. And we'll talk about the supposedly thing. Uh, hypothetically, there might be another way out after that. But um, uh, in West Virginia Annual Conference, the two things that really surprised me to hear are um, in Oklahoma, where I'm at, we have the Council of, uh, uh, not Council of Bishops, the Board of Trustees, the Conference Board of Trustees has put out an official disaffiliation agreement. Um, and so I'm, I'm showing that on my page here. And it's uh, 23 pages long. It was adopted by the annual conference last year. It's a very clear procedure for how individual churches exit, disaffiliate from the UMC. Um, we, in my conference, had just shy of 30 disaffiliations. There are a lot of other churches in the process. In West Virginia, zero churches have disaffiliated. Not only that, they have no disaffiliation agreement published at all. It hasn't been submitted to churches or leadership, hasn't been released on their website. On their website, they only have one article talking about disaffiliation. It's from 2019. So there has been no movement on paragraph 2553 and disaffiliations. The, the conference did designate an official to go and communicate with local churches about the option of disaffiliation. And what she has said to them is that paragraph 2553 does not apply to the circumstances of conservative churches, and so it won't be entertained. And it's not just she who has said that. Uh, the district superintendents have also said that. So what's going on is you have a majority annual conference, uh, majority conservative annual conference, where many of the conservatives are interested in at least having the conversation about disaffiliating. And the conference has designated someone to have that conversation, but they're saying that conversation really can't take place because... 2553 was written for liberals wanting to exit. And that's true. But what's also true is that our judicial council reviewed in decision number 1422, I've got it up on the page here, reviewed a ruling from Bishop uh, uh, Sue Halpert, is it Johnson? <laughs> I forget. Um, yeah, Halpert Johnson. She ruled that she would not question the reasons of conscience for why someone would want to exit. Now, that phrase comes from 2553. You got three reasons here why you can exit, and the first two definitely deal with a liberal worldview. The third is for reasons of conscience, that's the phrase there, uh, regarding the actions or inactions of its annual conference related to a change in the requirements and provisions of the Book of Discipline and related to the practice of homosexuality or related to the ordination, it goes on there. But the notion, is, the phrase is actions or inactions. And so if a, if a local congregation has a problem with the actions or inactions of an annual conference, they can honestly take the vote on paragraph 2553 to disaffiliate. Now, Judicial Council for uh, decision... Uh, number 1422 ruled that Bishop Sue Halpert Johnson was right to not question the reasons of conscience behind a church voting to disaffiliate. The The irony of this, of course, is that Bishop Sue Halpert Johnson then uh, just uh, in North Georgia said uh, no more disaffiliations, and um, so this kind of became moot for her. So if you haven't seen that, I did a video on that um, and it's confusing, and it's weird. Um, so that, to conservatives, the North Georgia Annual Conference looks like overt, heavy-handed, autocratic leadership. It looks like. I'm not saying it is that. I'm saying it looks like that. Now, in West Virginia, it's a very different thing. Um, there is not any grand statement from on high saying, no one will be allowed to disaffiliate. There's just quiet, uh, well, silence on the part of the leadership. And then it seems also to me, from talking to a few people, that there really doesn't seem to be a lot of pushback from conservative leaders. They all seem to to get along. Um, Knowlton's article, he speaks strongly in that place, but he also says that he's planning to stay till 2024 to see what happens at General Conference, which, of course, is what a lot of conferences are urging. And, of course, that would be sound advice if paragraph 2553 didn't expire at the end of this year. Um, I've gotten... Uh, corrected several times on saying that once, if you don't get out by the end of 2023, 20, you're trapped. 
They say that's conjecture because hypothetically they could design another process for exiting. And I, I don't argue with that. Anything's possible hypothetically. I'm, I want to talk about likelihoods. When we're talking about uh, a new liberal majority in the denomination, what is the likelihood that they're going to want to design a process whereby local churches can leave, thereby taking all of these assets away from annual conferences? Because remember, the annual conference technically owns all their stuff. What is the likelihood that they are going to sign off on a new plan for allowing that to happen? Uh, uh, paragraph 2548.2 was already uh, discounted by the Judicial Council because they said 2553 displaces it. I, of course, disagreed with that ruling, and as a lot of intelligent people did, but that's neither here nor there. One of the people I talked to in West Virginia said, he talked to his uh, DS, and the DS said, why would you want to do that when we can just use paragraph 2549 later? And I might do an episode on 2549. I, my, my legalese is not as strong as many, but 2549 is a procedure whereby a local church is just condemned and closed. Condemned might not be the right word. Closed and sold. So hypothetically, um, and according to this, this uh, article from UM News, is the United Methodist Church really? This is part of a series trying to correct uh, misinformation and, and false impressions. It dealt with two things. The first one, can the central conferences really not disaffiliate? And it affirms what I said. But the second one is um, what happens after 2553 expires? Is there going to be another way out for people? And it talks about different annual conferences trying to design a way out for local churches after 2553 expires. And, and I'm aware at least one annual conference said, we're not going to do anything this year, but we will have something in place afterwards. And the thing is, hypothetically, you know, I read paragraph uh, 2549 right before doing this. Hypothetically, it makes sense that such a thing could be designed. But the thing is, it depends entirely on conference leadership acting in good faith. And so there are some annual conferences where that good faith can be trusted, hypothetically. Um, if, if the bishop stays the same, it, it seems that Sandra um, Steiner Ball is uh, their bishop, she, she has earned their trust, and a lot of them just trust her and the district superintendents. She's surrounded herself with a diverse variety of people that have earned the trust of their people. It seems to me like um, the majority of their churches are trusting that something is going to be designed for them on down the line that is not going to be very punitive at all. Um, there are other conservatives that just say, look, even if we trust you, you're not going to be around for forever. A lot of things can change. General Conference can make some mandatory rules that we can't wiggle out of. We need out now. Right now, as I've talked to people in West Virginia, it doesn't seem to me that there has been an informed decision where the conservatives have gotten together and said, hey, we really trust our bishop and leadership. They're going to come through for us. We don't need to disaffiliate right now. We can focus on local ministry. It doesn't seem to me that that's happened. It seems like uh, conservatives there are like conservatives in a lot of places where they just don't want to talk about it. They don't want to be fearful. They don't want to be uh, doing this conjecture thing. They just want to be doing daily ministry, and uh, they feel ill-equipped to make these hard decisions, and it hurts them to think about spending that money or uh, having a church vote, and so they just kind of don't think about it. So I, my intention in doing this is not to to galvanize people or tell people what to do. Mine is just, you know, people need to know what's going on. Now, hypothetically, it's possible that West Virginia uh, could design a process next year after General Conference that uh, totally works out for any conservatives who just don't like this ride anymore and want to get off. Hypothetically, it could cost less money. It could be easier, um, and the annual conference could just close these properties and give them sell them right back, and everybody could be happy. That is a hypothetical reality. It's also a hypothetical reality that once 2553 uh, expires, that the General Conference says, no, we're not going to have any more disaffiliations. If anybody wants to leave, they can leave and just leave their real estate and assets to us because they did it under our umbrella. It's ours. And if they have a problem with it, that's too bad. And if they file suit, we will too. Um, and of course, we're living in a time where there has already been 
um, lawsuits, seized assets, um, declaration of exigent circumstances. So when those things have already taken place, and when you have, um, you know, the, the, the trust would be a lot stronger in my mind if conference officials were not saying that paragraph 2553 does not apply to conservative local churches. I think that the reality is with this judicial council decision, once that got released, then whether or not the conservative or liberal doesn't matter, that, that it's something that you have to leave open for people. And when you don't, that would make me very anxious. If I were in an annual conference where they're saying, yeah, we know 2553 was written for disaffiliation, but we're not going to come up with any plan. The other part I didn't mention is they don't even have a special called annual conference. So my annual conference is having three. It's already had one. It's having two more this year aimed at allowing any disaffiliating churches that want out to leave. But, uh, you know, I don't know how many other, you know, the Northwest Texas, I know those disaffiliations happened at a special called conference. West Virginia, the only conference they have scheduled for this year is their normal June annual conference and nothing after that. So hypothetically, what you're looking at in West Virginia is if you have not done all the paperwork, written the checks, uh, done all the exhibits for disaffiliation by like May, then hypothetically there's a possibility you're never getting out. And there are some churches, you know, I talked to one guy, he said a lot of these churches are um, older people, attendance is under 50, they're on life support, they're just hoping to be left alone for the next couple of years so that they can just die in peace. They don't, they don't have any energy for this. And if that's the case, I'm not going to cast dispersions at that. I, I, that makes complete sense. But if there are churches that are planning on being around for a long time and they're trying to figure out if they want this headache now or a, a much bigger headache later, potentially losing all their assets, and I did say potentially, then it makes sense to go ahead and have the conversation now. So that's pretty much how I see West Virginia right now. I think they're really lucky to have um, – conference leadership that that has been easy to work with and respectful of uh, their theology, that they don't feel threatened, is really quite a statement, you know, um, because they, they've got the same news networks we do over there, and they've, they've been able to stay less anxious than a lot of conservatives in other places. But just because they don't feel anxious doesn't necessarily mean that they shouldn't be. Um, so I, my, my thing I advocate for is just earnest and honest conversation uh, so I hope I've, I've helped that happen. If you think it's useful, pass it along. If you know of any other annual conferences that are similar to West Virginia, where it's conservative majority, but they're not running for the door, I'm very interested to know about this phenomenon. Um, and then if you know of other annual conferences where there is more open hostility or abuse, um, in particular, one thing I'm, I'm wanting to find is if there is any bad behavior on the part of conservatives. I want to know about it because it's, it seems clear to me there's a lot of um, resentment towards conservative evangelical voices, but I'm not seeing the specific things at play that, that are supposedly going on. So any documentation of that uh, would be interesting to me. So anyway, I'm going to call this thing to a close and just remind you to go ahead and promote this if you find it useful, and thank you. So we were doing post-production work on this, getting ready to release it, and uh, we saw something that kind of caught our attention with Bishop Steiner Ball. Um, apparently, in the mix of all these bishops retiring a couple of years ago, she and another bishop, Moore Kokoy, I think is her last name, have both collaboratively been responsible for Susquehanna Annual Conference, where it turns out there has been more than one church that had a disaffiliation vote that was scheduled that has now been put off. I couldn't figure out if they were given a new date for the vote or not. People have been reluctant to talk about this for some reason, uh, but it seems that accusation of misinformation has been used as a re reason for them to postpone these disaffiliation votes. So um, in my recording that I did uh, previously on this topic, I talked about Bishop Steiner Ball not using any heavy-handed techniques um, to keep 2553 from being implemented, but it would seem that at least in Susquehanna Annual Conference, her name is attached to uh, these, these postponements of votes. Um, so uh, I, I don't know much about this beyond that. Hopefully they're able to just figure out what the misinformation was and have a, a, a more informed vote. So as always, 
I hope everybody's against misinformation. This is something that's been showing up a lot, but unfortunately, a lot of times uh, the, the blanket charge of misinformation doesn't have names or dates or quotes attached to it, which is a problem. So um, hopefully if Susquehanna does have a problem, they're, they're able to solve the misinformation. But uh, if not, then, then hopefully they can move forward quickly.